Good evening, friends. Welcome to this edition of the Mystery Wine Blind Tasting. We've got a fun one, I think, this evening. It smells beautiful. A little bit lighter in color, perhaps. Ooh, what a beautiful nose. If you're smelling this along with me, let me know who's joining us tonight. I know a couple of our regular guests are actually downstairs dining right now. Um, the Bonos are here, and Kathy's here, and a few folks were in earlier hanging out at the bar and picking up the wine, and then said they'd be popping on a little bit later, so. Oh, man, that is gorgeous. I'm getting ahead of myself already because we should be looking at this first and then smelling, right? But there was an aroma that just jumped right out of the glass upon pouring it, and that, uh, that's alluring. If it catches your attention right off the bat, it's something to pay attention to and maybe just kind of log, catalog that idea. What, what scent did you pick up? What do you see? What, uh, what might be something that triggers a memory or a thought that you should pay attention to? <coughs> Not necessarily fixate on, but pay attention to, give credence to. If you've been doing this for a while, as many of you have, it's appropriate to, to rely a little bit on what your taste memories are bringing to the, uh, the experience as well. Candy and Kevin, good evening. Kristen and Johnny, hello. And Taylor's with you, great. And uh, Kathleen, you're here too. And Matt, I hope. Great to have you guys with us this evening. Cheers to all of you. And anybody else who's watching, if you'd like to chime in, please feel free to do so. Well, let's get started with this little number. This number, as I said, is a little bit lighter in color, but what else do you see? Rob and Kathy, great. Alex and Moira, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Candy, you're picking up that sweet licorice on the nose. That's awesome. Yeah, there is a there is that part. There's a this fruit kind of component. There's this herbal kind of component to this. Uh, there's an intriguing kind of nuanced, complex nose, which is exceptional. Um, I'm excited to actually try it. But from the visual standpoint, first, what do you see? We see a red wine. Do you see um, any signs of kind of aging? Do you see is this a see-through wine? Is this red? Is this purple? Is this kind of brickish in color? Is it uh, something that has more of a tawny kind of color to it? Hey, Dan, how are you? And hopefully Jordana's with you too. Cheers. For those of you that want a fantastic uh, contribution to your Facebook feed, uh, I would follow Mr. Dan Cole there. And uh, he has this amazing nature photography of some foxes um, that he's been tracking. I guess yourself tracking and then you have some um, like time-lapse kind of cameras that are out in the woods and the, the photography is remarkable. Um, and it's just a, a joy to watch these foxes kind of play around and hunt and care for one another and you know, tussle with one another. So it's really neat. Um, not at all, Dan, it's awesome. Yes, and hello, Jordana. Randy and Debbie, hello, good evening to have you. Great to have you with us too. So guys, for those of you who are just kind of joining, um, and maybe this being one of the first times you've done this or first time you've done it in a while, we tend to kind of go through a general format of, uh, of wine tasting here. That's a hybrid, if you will, of the Court of Master Sommelier's grid and a little bit of the WSET or Wine Spirit Education Trust kind of tasting format and a mix mash of those two. And then some things we've kind of developed through the process of doing this and some things that we use by way of uh, what we do and how we taste wine here at Field and Main. And so the first thing you wanna do before you get anything else is to look at the wine itself. And before you smell it, before you kind of dive into tasting it, because we can learn a lot from looking at it. And Kevin's noting that it sheets and has thin legs. And when he's talking about that, um, Candy's also noting light legs, right? Um, a cherry red color. So we're, we're learning a lot about this wine and what it might be by just the visual appearance of the wine. So when they're saying sheets and has thin legs, right? This is the formation as you swirl the wine in the glass where it goes to its top point, it will start to come back down in the glass. And does it come down as a full sheet? Does it come back down as tiers? And then do those tiers form solid legs that stay and are easy to see? So when you say it's sheeting, it's kind of coming down one sheet fast, pretty quick, thin legs, if any legs, right? They're there for a minute and then they dissipate. This is an indication of a wine of potentially less alcohol, potentially uh, no residual sugar. Um, it's a wine that, that should be considered more on the lighter end of the spectrum than robust by way of body weight. Because body weight comes from 
the experience of the grape being a little ball of sugar that's fermented into alcohol. And whether you leave residual sugar, and that's kind of a think of it like syrup, or if you vinify all of that sugar out and leave it dry, so-called dry, you could have a higher alcohol that then also leaves texture. Um, and so, Danny, welcome. You made it. I'm glad to have you with us. Uh, this texture is something we can see and we'll also certainly perceive on the palate when we taste it, but we can see it here. And so that already off the bat tells you this is probably a lighter wine, right? The, the cherry red color, the lighter profile in terms of the, the sheeting than the light legs and tears indicates we're probably talking about a varietal that doesn't have as thick a skin and maybe a cooler climate. That's where that leads us to, as a maybe. We'll have to do more kind of sussing that out as we get there, but right off the bat with that reddish color and that light presentation of structure, we're not thinking this is Tanat or Petit Verdot, right? So if you were, if you did, if we talked as we just did and said all the things we just said, and then said, I think the potential varietal for this would be Tanat or Petit Verdot, you'd be kind of off base. So what you could say though, right, is what, guys? What, what kind of grape or grapes should we be thinking about here if we're not, say, thinking about Petit Verdot and Tanat? We'll come back to that question, but I'm, I'm looking myself at, uh, per the prompt of Kristen, or Johnny, I'm not sure which, um, the, the rim is a little bit watery. And that watery rim is also an indication potentially of higher alcohol, of some alcohol. So this might have some alcohol, but be a thinner skin grape like Pinot Noir, which is now popping in. Jordana is saying Zinfandel too. Pinot, absolutely. Pinot Noir being one thing we should consider. Zinfandel can absolutely present in a reddish kind of fashion like this. Can be darker too, but for sure, Grenache could be uh, in a lighter kind of presentation, more of a sandy soil perhaps. Um, we could be talking about Gamay. We could be talking about uh, Pulsard. We could be talking about um, a whole host of thinner skin, lighter varieties, right? So um, something to consider as we go forward. We have already a profile for this wine. And now we'll just work on verifying what we've seen and kind of uh, resounding whether or not that, that visual presentation of this wine matches up with the taste and the scent. And we'll go from there. So let's go do the scent. Is Beaujolais Nouveau today? Oh my gosh, it is a Thursday, right? Yes. Um, this would be funny if it was Gamay on Beaujolais Nouveau Day. And it's not Beaujolais Nouveau, thankfully. I uh, had one really bad experience with that, and I can't go back. Um, I'm sure there's much better Beaujolais Nouveau out there than what I drank. I mean, I think I drank volumes of the Georges de Boeuf when I was in graduate school, and not a good day. Um, I've had many of those stories from people about the, the one alcohol that they had that they just can't go back to. For most, I think, in my career, it's been tequila. Um, but it's Beaujolais Nouveau for me. Uh, a, sad, a sad admission on my part, but. All right, when you smell this, we've got some kind of licorice root, right? Some reddish fruit. We're looking for a few things, remember? A few things, fruit, earth, and wood. F-E-W, fruit, earth, and wood. So from the fruit side of the spectrum, we had cherry out there. What else? Does anybody pick up anything fruity? Even as I say it, fruity, it kind of may shy you or, or skew you toward a presentation of fruit. It doesn't have to be a fruity fruit. It can be a dried fruit. It can be a cooked fruit. It can be a medicinal fruit. It can be uh, a whole host of different forms of fruit. Ah, Dan, we're, well, we welcome shameless plugs for, for Walsh at any point. Um, and shameless plugs for wines that are fun, for sure. And a Malbec Nouveau for Thanksgiving sounds delicious. <laughs> Gallo jugs, ooh, yeah, that's no good, that's no good. Sorry, Kevin. It's okay at this point, right? Like, because you don't need those in your life. There's other wines to drink for sure, and so. Ken, you're getting some earth, cool. Stewed cherries, red currant, very good. Kathleen, nice call, I like the red currant, right? So red currant being a way to say tart red fruit. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something most of us snack on on a regular basis, basis currants, but if you have, they're tart and red. And so they have this quality that, um, that really is a fantastic descriptor for wine where the fruit isn't fully ripe per se, it has a tartness to it. Uh, stewed cherries, those also presenting them some ripeness, and I'm getting both those things, where this is an interesting wine presenting some ripe characteristics and some underripe characteristics potentially, or some cooler 
climate characteristics. Like we have that watery rim, which indicates higher alcohol, so maybe a warm climate. We have that stewed fruit, stewed cherries, which indicates a warmer climate, a warmer kind of presentation of fruit. And then you have some of this sort of earthy, spicy notes that are in here. Maybe those are coming from wood, that spice can. Um, that tart element maybe is a cooler site in a warmer place, um, a, a warmer vintage in a cool place, right? You have those things happening here. Candy, when you say I get the earth and not the wood, what kind of earthy notes are you picking up? <laughs> Ooh, Dan's regretting barbecue for dinner. That's fair. There's a, um, hmm. There's a pretty quality to the, uh, the fruit still on the palate as well. There's a little booziness at the end, yeah? It's like almost a, an amplification of a little bit of spice. And there's a tiny bit of tannin. I gotta go back and try it again, but is that tannin or is that just a little bit of warmth? Um, hmm. So that fruity kind of stewed cherry, red currant, earthy element, maybe a little bit of spice in the way of some wood. I'm getting kind of a, a little bit of a cedary note, a tiny bit of spice, indicating maybe there's a tiny bit of a, a small portion of some oak aging, not necessarily a very big dollop of new oak. Um, When you char oak barrels, they present in wines oftentimes as having some kind of spice. And so I think there's a hint of that here. I don't think it's you know, a real prominent element, so I don't think this is necessarily a wine that saw a whole bunch of new oak. And I don't know that from the body light weight, right, it would have needed it. And so and there's still kind of an ample quality of that fruit. It's not getting in the way. Uh, the oak isn't getting in the way or masking the quality of the fruit that's there. Candy, you're picking up more old world, cool. And I like what you just said there, more structure than fruit in the palate. So let's taste this wine if you haven't yet already and we'll talk about what that means. Mm. Yeah, spice like cinnamon. Mm. So, Kenny, when you say more structure than fruit, I'm getting a lot more fruit up front, and then it builds or di kind of dissipates, actually. It sort of truncates. Uh, but the wine builds into its structure. And the structure, I think, is coming more from alcohol than, say, from wood or from tannin. It's not extremely tannic. Tannin oftentimes kind of grips you on the gums and bonds. Uh, it, it wants to bond to, to protein, and so just kind of grips you on the gums generally if it's if it's higher in tannin. It's got a drying sensation here that I think is more about alcohol than it is about tannin. The spice is there though. Ooh, it's kind of getting a little bit meaty. Hmm. What so what the question is, and that's what I'm as I pause there for a moment, I'm I'm asking myself the question about what can be fruity reddish fruit have a little bit higher alcohol, plush fruit quality, and yet this kind of meaty, spicy note that's building here. Um, it does have a good acidity, and so we're talking about body weight, acidity, tannin. Yeah, Kristen, I like, I like your point there. I like that, I think that's exactly right. So it's drying from alcohol, not some tannins. You've got it decanted for 45 minutes. So you're, you're ahead of where I am. Um, Andy, what is that word? Papapu. Potpourri? <laughs> um, <laughs> Dan, it doesn't require planning ahead, but you can certainly plan ahead as Kristen has. Some people can't resist. I've enjoyed many a conversation with people who say they played the game and they've actually concluded uh, finished most of the bottle before we even started <laughs> and watched along in a happy state of uh, a, a light buzz. Um, yeah, there's a little effervescence. Uh, it's kind of youth, 
maybe from that bottle, right? So there's not a lot of rim variation, and so it's pretty young, and that young youngness can be a little CO2 that's sort of trapped in the bottle and just kind of comes out. You see that more often than not on the wines, white wines, it's a lot easier to kind of identify, but this sort of has a light and delicate quality to it. Fruity elements, so maybe we should be considering Gamay in sort of a, a Beaujolais context. Hmm. Beaujolais Village, kind of bringing us up there, maybe. Um, so where in the world could this come from? When you're, when you're talking about the fruit, earth, and wood elements that we've tried, we've got fruit in the way of kind of ripe cherry, cooked cherry, tart red fruit that kind of reflects some of the acidity that's here and that lingers with this wine. From a structural standpoint, it's a little bit on the lighter side of things. It probably has a little bit of a higher alcohol or the alcohol doesn't read as integrated into the wine as maybe it could. Um, and the fruit is all right now really amply up front. It's in the nose and it's definitely on the front half to maybe even front third of just the, of the palate. If we say old world, which some among us have, um, where would you go? And you can kind of approach this multiple ways, right? So if you, you say old world, then you can start to work countries and places and regions within those countries. Or if you're thinking about the presentation and the structure and what varietals it might mean, you can use the varietals to take you to places, case in point. So we said this is lighter in structure and kind of interesting and more Pinot-like. If we're talking about old world and Pinot, we have to talk about Burgundy first and foremost. And then we can go to Germany, we could go to Austria, um, certainly can go to Northern Italy for some Pinot Nero that's there, uh, into the sort of Eastern Europe kind of area, um, Hungary kind of Bergenland, Austria kind of world, Britain will make a little bit of Pinot Noir too. Um, we're talking about going with a varietal like Gamay, then you have to go to Beaujolais, right? So, um, Candy, you're picking up more French than Spain or Italy, maybe Germany. Chris, welcome. Courtney, hopefully you're there too, hi. Welcome aboard. It's helpful when you come aboard at, at, at this point too because we can recap. We were just about kind of doing that. So uh, on the nose, ripe fruit, ripe cherries, um, a little bit of kind of a licorice quality. There's some red currant too. Uh, very expressive from a fruit standpoint. There's a little bit of a cinnamon spice, spiced note, um, clove maybe, kind of a hint of that. Not a real prominent oak signature, but it's there. And then a higher alcohol potentially despite it being a lighter body presentation. So cooler climate, old world is sort of what people are thinking, but there's a ripeness to the fruit. So maybe a good exposition or riper sight. <clears throat> I'm with you kind of on the French more than Spain or Italy. I don't, I don't really think this is Spain or Italy. Um, I agree with that. There's, a, there's a, an interesting quality to kind of the Italian red acidity, um, which I'm not picking up here. And there's a plushness to sort of the fruit um, there's, I think, a case that you generally would find a bit more intensity of the, the ripeness of the fruit from a Spanish perspective. Again, there's a thousand examples probably of where that's not true. But as you try to parse this out and work the, 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 the more common angles, this is that. Um, yeah, Chris, I think Germany, Austria. Um, <laughs> Kathy, wonderful to have that as a thought. You, you could pop upstairs and, and, and photobomb away. Great addition, Chris, yes, Blau Frankisch. So Blau Frankisch, Gamay, Pinot Noir. I like that idea a lot um, because I think it expresses, uh, I don't think we're talking about Pinot Noir here by way of the fruit expression and that alcohol. The bottle game in Austria, that can mess with you. Um, this bottle game, can really mess with you. Jordana Alsace is a cool idea too. Yeah, there's certainly Pinot Noir grown there too. Um, I mean, that would be really neat. I think it would be in a different bottle if we're playing the bottle game. But uh, so the bottle game, right? The bottle game is all about the shape of the bottle, and this one is more Bordeaux shaped. Um, yeah, Kathy, this, the tannins are definitely restrained. They're not. They're not real present. We're all thinking kind of lighter, lighter varietal, lighter skin varietal, Gamay, Pinot Noir, Blau Frankish, something like that. 
You can get Blaufrankisch in a burgundy bottle. You can get Blaufrankisch in this bottle too. Uh, this is the bottle that's traditionally used for, say, Bordeaux varietals with something with more structure, but it's also more of a universal bottle now too. Um, the cork and top, that's super cheating from an Austria standpoint, right? Because you're looking for the red stripe um, on the top of there, and I didn't see that, but um, we would we would have ru removed the capsule. So I don't think from that standpoint we're probably not talking about Austria. Wow. So maybe we put us in Germany or back to to kind of Beaujolais. Hmm. And that's a you know that's a parlor trick way of playing the the game as opposed to playing the wine itself. So. You're looking at the bottle, looking at the cork, looking at the capsule. It's elementary, my dear Watson. It's noticing the details. You're trying to figure out exactly what the wine is without having to actually know the wine. Hmm. For you statisticians out there, it's working data points and creating a map that takes you right to where the wine is. So if we recount the data points, right, where are we? A lighter expression wine with reddish fruit, moderate to low, low tannins, higher alcohol that's kind of messing with the acidity to make you think there's a kind of a tannin experience because it's drying, it's astringent. There's almost a bitterness here. Um, hmm. We seem to think it's more on the old world side of the, of the spectrum, and I think I agree with that. Generally speaking, the acidity's there. Um, Past two grand. Candy, nice call. Past two grand blend of Gamay and Pinot Noir. Very nice call. That I don't think would be in this bottle at all, this shape, but really a cool idea. And absolutely. Um, a varietal or blend, too. It's a very good question. So one of the things you always look at when you're talking about varietal or blend is whether or not this wine has things that are hard to understand being in the same glass. For example, the kind of current tart fruit and the very ripe kind of stewed fruit, they could come from two different picks, two different elevations within the same site and blending of the two. They could come from two different varietals. Um, as a result, you can think about a blend, right? Uh, and otherwise, if you're looking at more of a harmonious kind of set of characteristics that are more, in, or more indicative of one varietal, then you stick with it. And so, I think I'm on the camp that it's more of a varietal, a single varietal bottling. But it sure would be neat if it was a blend because there's a, a lightness to this that I think you'd always get, you'd also gain generally like a little bit more complexity or body weight too from a blend. Um, it's hard to think of a light blend, although Pastu Grand is a good example of one that is lighter. Um, I like the Gamay call. I'm, I'm, I should just work the wine, but I'm, if it's a Gamay too from, from Beaujolais and it's in this bottle, I'm going to be surprised. So maybe something like Blauberg under from Germany. So Pinot Noir from Germany. Um, but it would be weird to put that in this bottle. So this bottle is catching me up and it's not supposed to, right? I shouldn't be thinking necessarily about that. So let's pour a little bit more. Could this be something we're not thinking about? Wow. It's getting more expressive. Has it changed? Um, Kristen, you said you had it open for 45 minutes. The spice profile building for you, and it's getting uh, a little bit poopy, a little bit baby diapery. Hmm. Yeah, the finish is almost bitter. Candy, I agree. It's not tannin. So uh, there's like an alcohol finish that um, a bit retronasal, and it definitely is drying, uh, like like rubbing alcohol drying away um, right on almost immediately on the surface uh, that it's put on. Yeah, you know, Chris, others have noted the bubbly, too, that sort of spritziness. Maybe it's got a little carbonic maceration to it where we're talking about a varietal that has structure and ripeness, um, picked ripe, 
but allowed to be made at least partially here with carbonic maceration. And that's something that we haven't talked about uh, necessarily, but it's something you consider from the Beaujolais Nouveau context, right? So you put grapes in a tank, seal the tank, and fill it with a little carbon dioxide, carbonic uh, maceration. Maceration meaning something soaking uh, on itself, like a fruit macerating in sugar or macerating in its own juice. But the carbonic, the carbonic uh, maceration is a CO2 in that closed space, creates enough of a little bit of a pressure that the grapes, as they ripen and they're ripe, they sort of split open and the juice begins to run free outside of the, uh, of the, of the grapes being kind of naturally pressed by that pressure and interact with the skins, gaining color as they come in contact, but it's not the same thing as pressing and extracting as heavily. And so a carbonic kind of presentation of, uh, of gamay, partial carbonic, um, partial carbonic, uh, anything else. <laughs> um, a little Cab Franc spiciness. It's coming out that way. Yeah, it's coming out more earthy. So could this be like a carbonic, partial carbonic macerated kind of Cab Franc or from the Loire Valley? You know, light presentation there, interesting earthen, rotting leaves is coming out for Kristen. Yeah, it's, it's morphing and changing, which is one of the parts as I looked up to my right, um, your left there. It, it, um, I'm always doing that at 722, because at 722, 723, 724, the wines usually change, or at least evolve, kick into another gear. And this one did, it's no different than the others. And so, um, I don't know. I feel like we know a lot, and I don't know that I'm particularly clear on any one place or region or grape. And so, at this point, it's Kind of like, what isn't it then? What can you start to chip away at? We said Pinot Noir in the beginning, and we said oh, Old World. I'm not going to say, I'm not comfortable saying that this is Burgundy. So I can take away Burgundy. I'm not sure I can take away Gamay and a Pinot Noir, Gamay, Gamay production from Beaujolais. I think that still is in the running for me. I'm more and more liking the idea of a really light kind of Touraine expression of Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley that has a little lightness, a little bit of funk uh, to it. Um, I'm still liking the idea of a Blauburgunder or a Pinot Noir from Germany. Um, Kristen, I think the Cahors Malbec, would, this would be too light for that. I think you would get so much more power from that. Um, Chris, you're 100% correct that we also could take credit for ruling out all the white wines and all the rosés. And if we were getting points for each one, we could rack up a, a great amount of points just doing that. Um, closer to the target, uh, working my way away from Italy too, um, although I'm still kind of pondering in my head something maybe fascinating and interesting and weird from the northern part of Italy. Uh, Alsace was thrown out for Pinot Noir too, and I think that'd be a very interesting experience. Um, I don't know that we'd get that in this bottle, but... Um, So I think I'm coming back to liking more the idea of uh, a German kind of Pinot, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I'm not sure. Hmm. Whatever it is, it's really come kind of compelling in, in this exercise in particular. Like I, I would enjoy drinking the wine, but in this exercise, it's uh, it's kind of a it's a dance partner that you're happy to be dancing with, but it's never quite full contact. Like you're just it's they're moving you around the, the floor, and you're not quite keeping up with it. Um, so something, how do you place carbonic maceration to a particular place? The only place that's definitively known for it is um, is Beaujolais, and so we could go to Beaujolais and, and play that, but the, there are other elements here that are not 
particularly Beaujolais, like the fruit comes off of carbonic maceration in Beaujolais and it's more tutti fruity, and this is not that. So, I mean, this could be like Blaufrankisch Merlot kind of blend, could have a little Syrah in it, I mean, something like that from Germany that uh, just is an interesting wine um, that's tasty and unique. Um, it could be the Cabernet Franc element we're talking about from the Loire Valley that has a little bit more funk to it and is not as concentrated as, say, something like Chinon or Bourgogne. Uh, so more of a general appellation like Touraine or something like that. And I have to pick something. That's the, that's the rule of this game. So... I'm, gonna sit, I'm just going to stay with uh, sort of a German... <laughs> a German Blauburgunder, kind of Pinot Noir, uh, young, 2020, 2019, 2020, uh, 2020 kind of presentation. Um, but I wouldn't bank a lot on that. Anybody else want to plant a flag before we reveal? Kristen's going Alsace, cool. Alsace is a nice call. Um, got spices there. Mm. 2019 Pinot for Kristen. Alsace, cool. Anybody else feel comfortable throwing one out there? It's perfectly okay. <gasps> Why, hello. You're up for the reveal. <laughs> Kathy's joining us. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hello. Having her birthday dinner downstairs. Exactly. I don't know. I definitely got some characteristics of Cab Franc. Yeah. I could see EMA on the lightness, but it doesn't have that carbonic sort of uh, bubblegum. Yep. Tutti Fruity bubblegum tutti kind of yep. thing. Um, so we've got Alsatian Pinot Noir. Yeah. Um, could have gone Austrian, but everybody played the bottle game and there wasn't the stripe. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, which is an unfair the, way to play the, the game. All the tricks that we right? look for um, in so, the shape of the bottle and all right, that stuff. Right, that kind of messes up the... I, I kind I'm, of got a loss. I'm, I'm but German Pinot Noir, but it's not... I'm not 100% on that. I'm not convinced. My initial thought was Cap Franc, but I wasn't sure of where from. Because it had kind of an earthiness mm -hmm. with, yep. the, with the fruit that I really like. There was certainly that note of that It's sort really of, pretty wine, but it's... But it's also like even lighter than some Cap Francs that Correct. I've had. Correct. That's what I was saying. So kind of I terrain. kind of went away from yeah, Cap Franc. It has alcohol. It, it so has it's alcohol. ripe. Right. It's ripe, light, and has alcohol. But I'm it's looking certainly to see what young. It is. Yeah, it's not what bad. What is it? Okay, so it's French. Pays d'Hero, Les Heritiques. Um, so just kind of a general. We're gonna have to figure out what that is. We're gonna have to Google. Yeah. Google somebody. So Heritique. This is an interesting wine, Pays de Route. So this is sort of a, a, a broader appellation, not a specific. Um, I believe I've tried this once. 21, but I don't recall at all what the varietal is. Maybe Carignan or um, anybody have anybody Carignan, can... single varietal. Oh, wow. That's really cool. That's very pretty. Okay, um. so such some structure, earthy quality, cherry fruit, mm -hmm. it's sinewy. Um, but it, what didn't present sinewy as much in the tannin as I might have expected. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> it's easier. It's French. We've got to give ourselves a little credit for, although I just said German, and it's half <laughs> carbonic maceration. Oh, so that wow. That explains a whole bunch about where the tannin is not because it didn't extract as much from the skins. We were circling around this one. We just didn't hit that point. And how would we hit, you know, Pays de Rote? Uh, 100% uh, varietal carrying on that's half carbonic. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, wow. Well, she she pulls all kinds of stuff out Fun of her ones. bag. Yeah. This is um, really a neat wine. This a is a very, great wine a very for very approachable for, red wine for, for Thanksgiving. For, yeah, that would be really really well received at the table. Not too bold for the non-red drinkers. Exactly. It, perfect. How was dinner? Delicious. Course of I'm, the still night. Eating, I'm still eating. Um, I would say the the hanger steak with the tostones. 
amazing. That's, uh, that's, jo- every, that's every, Joffrey's upbringing right there from every from Puerto course Rico. was amazing. The the halibut with the cashew crisp was amazing. So we've got a bunch of stuff left over. So we're going to eat large tomorrow. Very good. Over. Very good. Well, to all Hi, of you, everybody. and thank you for popping up. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Thanks for playing. What a delight. Wow. You know, it's fun when you lose, and you get to lose like this. A carbonic carignan from France. That's pretty cool. 2021. Well done, everybody. Um, I got to give you a lot of credit, because uh, together, we got really close. We identified elements in this wine that, uh, that were correct. We just didn't exactly nail the wine, and that's perfectly fine, because it indicates how much we've done together as a group, tasting over time. And I tell you, it's a great joy of mine, for sure. So thank you. I look forward to doing it again, and uh, we'll see you in December. For those of you that I'd see beforehand or around the holidays, happy holidays to you. If I don't see you in, uh, in advance of, of Thanksgiving, let me uh, wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving. It's the, from the food and wine standpoint, it's the best holiday of the year. So be with family, be with friends, drink great wines, and enjoy great food. Uh, it's everything Field Maine's about for sure, and what we love about all of you who appreciate that too. Cheers. <laughs>